Good day, everyone, and welcome to the session on Blender Cloud Render Farming using Amazon Web Services, Deadline, and Brenda. My name is Sterling Getz, and today you'll be learning about some cool new tools available to build your own affordable render farm in the cloud. We'll be covering some AWS concepts and then jumping into how we could utilize AWS with Blender-friendly commercial software from Thinkbox Software, and then how we can do the same with a set of free and open source Python scripts called Brenda, which were developed specifically for Blender. If you've tried making animations using Blender and Cycles, then chances are you're familiar with the enormous computing resources needed to do it quickly and at high quality. Highly optimizing Cycles render settings and faking effects is a real survival skill, but sometimes you simply need the massive computing power to get the effects that you're after. Andrew Price recently reposted a stat from about how Pixar's Monsters University was so complex, it took 29 hours per frame to render, and you could bet those folks know what they're doing. I'll be the last person to discourage you from treating yourself to a high-end GPU, CPU, or RAM upgrade on your workstation. Blender and Cycles is really interactive and fun on a well-spec system, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But when you've finally completed that 4K, high frame rate, ultra photorealistic animation, it's annoying to give up your CG workstation for a week and deal with fan noise, heat, and electricity bills that make you feel like you're mining for bitcoins. Plus, many in the Blender community are doing great work on minimally specced desktop and notebook computers. If you'd like to be inspired by just how scalable Blender and Cycles can be, I recommend you check out a spectacular Blender animation called Cycles Island Revisited Volume 2 by Peter Brainter, who goes by Pred on YouTube. I've left a link for that video in the session notes, and I highly recommend watching it. Peter used a supercomputer to render a landscape flyover that included billions of object instances, and it's inspiration like that that motivates many of us to build cloud render farms. At this point, you may be asking yourself, why not just use a commercial render farm service? Blender users have many at their disposal, and if you're a non-technical Blender artist, then you can stop watching this video, as this is probably the way to go. Those services do a really great job at simplifying the process of turning a dot blend into rendered frames with minimal technical knowledge. However, if you're like me, and a technologist as much as an artist, then you might get a kick out of taking control of the IT side of things and learn a thing or two about the cloud. I've used commercial render farm services in the past, and at the time I used them, they were really struggling to keep up with the rapid pace of Blender development. Sometimes, you want to use the latest BuildBot or OpenMovie Blender build to access some feature that was only released yesterday. Building your own cloud render farm gives you back that level of control. And it also offers you the ability to leverage cloud computing resources at a fraction of the cost, which is something that we'll be looking at shortly. So let's jump in and take a look at one solution available from Thinkbox software called Deadline version 7. This is the Thinkbox software website, and as you can see, they actually make a number of different products. Krakatoa looks pretty nifty, but what we're interested in today is Deadline version 7, which is a render management system. I've run into the Thinkbox software folks a couple of times at SIGGRAPH, and their solution always looked pretty neat to me. It has native Blender support, and their new releases, uh, along with them, they've published some tutorial videos on YouTube showing how their software can automatically build out a render farm in several different cloud vendor environments, such as Amazon AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, and others. What they failed to mention in those videos is that the cloud automation feature didn't actually ship with version 7, but it's still in development. Uh, as it turns out, that uh, beta program has just opened up to public, so if you want to have a play with it, you're more than welcome. Um, at the time that I tested it, I figured it was still worth looking at the software, so I built the cloud infrastructure manually to evaluate things. Deadline is an enterprise-ready render management software package, and it includes some nice features such as flexible job scheduling and notifications, shotgun and F-track integration. It includes a basic post-render compositing engine, and the ability to generate post-render review videos in QuickTime format. It also includes some nifty utilization graphing and statistics like those shown in the screenshot on the slide and many other features. The, the software smartly is offered free for up to two render nodes. And that's cool because Amazon and other cloud platform providers offer computers with up to 36 processors and 60 gigs of RAM. That means that for only the cost of the actual rendering hardware, you can have up to 72 processors chewing on your cycle's ray tracing. 
And if you're curious, you can try out what the software's like with some free underpowered systems from Amazon. Should you outgrow those two free nodes from Thinkbox, you'll need to purchase the software at $185 per node, but it's still pretty fun that you'll get two free render nodes for free, and if you're a small studio, this may suit you just fine. Now, before we get into how all this works, we need to cover some basic Amazon Cloud Services concepts and terminology. Amazon Web Services, or AWS, is a huge set of computing data centers established around the world originally to run Amazon's e-commerce services. A broad employee there realized that they had to build their data centers for maximum site peak usage, which in the USA is usually around Christmas, Black Friday, or Cyber Monday. And at other times, their expensive IT compute storage and networking equipment was sitting dormant and costing the company money. So AWS was born for Amazon to resell that capacity to others. In my day job as an IT consultant, I could tell you that the trend towards utilizing cloud computing is enormous. Most organizations agree that cloud computing environments can be more resilient and more secure than internal computing environments, especially for small businesses. Now, registration for AWS is free and you're automatically provisioned a virtual private cloud or a VPC. Although a credit card is required for that, there's no monthly service fee and you only get charged when you start using their non-free tier of computing resources. Even then, you only pay by the hour for when you use. Your VPC is put into a region which maps to a physical set of data centers and in those you can instantiate Elastic Compute Cloud instances which are effectively virtual computers which typically run server operating systems and normally Blender rendering software on top of those. Instance types are pre-configured hardware profiles for different kinds of compute loads and they come with different costs. So in our case, we're interested in instance types optimized for computing to do all that glorious cycles ray tracing. And when we instantiate an EC2 instance, we specify an Amazon machine image or an AMI, which is a, a disk drive with pre-configured operating systems and applications. Vendors like Ubuntu and Microsoft offer pre-configured instances of their server operating systems, and even Amazon offers a Linux distribution AMI. You're welcome to build your own AMI, and of course you can share it with the public after you do so. Okay, let's take a look at what some of these concepts look like in the Amazon Web Services Management Console. So this is the Management Console here. As you can see, Amazon offers a, a number of services, including the one that we're interested in today, which is EC2 virtual servers in the cloud. Um, you'll notice here that we're scoped down to a specific data center, in this case, uh, US West, Northern California, because I'm based out of uh, Los Angeles. And if we jump into the EC2 dashboard, uh, you'll notice a couple of different things. Um, first of all, uh, here's the instances that I was talking about earlier. I've run up a couple of instances here. Uh, these two specifically uh, to run deadline, they're actually running now. You can see from the instance state. You can also see what instance type they are. Uh, in this case, they're a C32X large. Well, uh, like we talked about earlier, an instance type is a hardware profile. So Amazon has a, a website where you can look up their various different hard, pre-configured hardware profiles and what configurations they include. They have compute optimized systems, network optimized systems, disk optimized systems. Um, in this case, we're interested obviously with our ray tracing in compute optimized. So uh, the C4 instances are their latest generation that runs Intel Xeon Haswell processors. Uh, as you can see, they go up to 36 processors, sorry, 36 virtual CPUs and up to 64 gigs of RAM. So that should handle just about any cycles project you could throw at it. Uh, they also offer slightly cheaper their last generation, which is a C3 that runs Intel Ivy Bridge processors at up to 32 gigs of RAM and 60 gigs, sorry, 32 procs and 60 gigs of RAM. Um, just to keep my cost down, I'm actually running a C3 2X large as part of this demo. Uh, which includes 8 procs and 15 gigs of RAM. They also have another page here where you can look up what the prices are, and this is refreshed dynamically. So first you select your server operating system, then you select your region, and then you look up in this table, it'll tell you uh, a C3, uh, sorry, C3 2X large with 8 procs uh, and 15 gigs of RAM will run you, uh, and it runs uh, two SSDs of 80 gigs each, 
uh, runs 75 cents an hour. So uh, if we go over to our management console here, uh, you can actually change your instance type pretty easily. Uh, if you shut down the system, uh, here we'll, we'll do it with this one, uh, you can actually select instance settings and then change instance type. Uh, and then uh, from the drop down here, you can just really select which hardware profile you want. And uh, as soon as you turn that machine on, when it boots, uh, it'll recognize the new memory, RAM, and so forth that you've associated with it. And that's pretty much it. Um, in this, you can also specify different AMI images. Uh, what I typically do is I take a base AMI image from Windows or uh, Ubuntu, I configure it the way I want, and then I right click here and uh, I will go to image, create image. Uh, that actually creates an AMI here. And then when you start up these instances or you create new ones, you can actually specify an AMI image to use. Uh, you can also uh, do snapshots and all sorts of tricky stuff in here, which we won't be getting into today, but that's uh, basically the gist of running EC2 instances within the Amazon Web Services console. There are a number of steps required to get things up and running with Deadline and Blender. I decided to build my two servers in AWS using Windows Server 2012 R2. Windows Server had a few advantages for me as a Windows user, but as it turns out, Amazon charges more to run Windows-based EC2 instances than to run Linux-based instances. I can only assume that that's because the costs include a hidden fee to cover Microsoft Windows licensing. Since Deadline can run on Linux, you may want to go with Ubuntu or other Linux distro. Now, I configured my server using the built-in wizards such that one was a domain controller and the other was a domain member. I also used the configuration wizards to set up the domain controller as VPN remote access server to support tunneling into the virtual private cloud. From past experience, domain membership simplifies many things like access rights and DNS resolution. And the configuration wizards were kind enough uh, to set up a dynamic DNS name hosted by Microsoft that provided me a common DNS name that I could use to VPN in when the public IP address on my servers changed each time I shut them down and brought them back up. I then installed the Deadline software, and the first step is to install the Deadline repository, which is a shared file system and database that was installed on the first server. Uh, the Deadline client was installed on both servers to enable them to be render nodes and then connect back to the repository. And the latest Blender version was then installed on both, and they were good to go. Uh, de deadline operation is all graphically oriented, but I suspect the deadline render nodes render jobs using Blender via the command line. And uh, I VPNed into the first server from my home computer and then installed the deadline client software. And uh, there, uh, that includes a Blender deadline render submission add-on and a deadline monitoring application. So at this point, you're ready to submit your render jobs. Once your render jobs are submitted, you can monitor the job via the Deadline mobile application, which is shown on this slide down in the lower right. Let's take a look at what the Deadline and Blender setup looks like once it's all installed and configured. So we'll start by going to the Amazon Web Service Console. As you can see, we've got our two Deadline servers running here. This is the first server that I installed. I uh, wanted to show you guys what it looks like when you connect to a system. So if you just right click and click connect, what happens is it, it allows you to download a remote desktop file, which is really, uh, if it's a Windows system, you use remote desktop uh, connections to get to it. If it's a Linux system, it'll uh, give you connection information for SSH. Uh, if you make a remote desktop connection into the Windows system, it looks like this. And I just wanted to show you, so Blender is installed, and if we go down here, scroll over a little bit, you can see uh, Deadline software is also installed. Uh, because this is the first Deadline system, I installed the repository, and then I installed the Deadline client. And with the Deadline client comes a couple of software packages, uh, the first of which is Deadline Slave. That's what actually executes the Blender command line tasks. You have Deadline Pulse. That allows you to uh, provide a web service that the mobile client connects to that allows your mobile deadline monitoring application to view the monitoring status of your render farm. Then you have uh, Deadline Balancer, which allows you to balance jobs across both internal data center-based render nodes 
and cloud-based render nodes and uh, maybe between two data centers. Uh, you have your launcher, which is uh, a job launcher that allows you to initiate a job on a remote node. And then there's Deadline Monitor, and that is a fairly sophisticated monitoring application for looking at your, your render uh, farm, and we'll look at that in just a minute. So I wanted to show you, uh, actually we'll go back there, I wanted to, to show you on this system right now, uh, currently there's zero CPU utilization because we haven't submitted any jobs to the system. Okay, so uh, the first thing we do, uh, if we wanna connect to this system, is to VPN into it. So I'm just gonna come over here and I'm using the native Windows client VPN. Uh, and that's configured to connect to this first deadline server, which is running a, a Windows server VPN. Okay, we're now VPN into the network. So we're connected just as if we were another one of these systems in this data center. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and uh, just, just to demonstrate that, um, you can actually see this is the server here. We have full file access to uh, the repository, which is holding a lot of the configuration information for the render farm, as well as the, the projects directory. And I, I like to render things out to network accessible locations. So I've created this folder here, render three, and uh, we'll use that in just a second as we submit the job from Blender. So here I am in Blender and I wanted to show you guys, so the, in the user preferences, this is where you configure the submit Blender to deadline add-on. It's a fairly simple Python script uh, that comes with the software package. It gives you this extra menu item up here where you can say submit to deadline. And uh, what I have here is uh, a job that is a 360 degree uh, turntable. I've lowered it down to just two frames for the interest of time uh, just to show you what it looks like to submit a job. So we'll say robot test render number three uh, because I've submitted a couple of jobs just testing this before my demo here. Um, again, uh, make sure that wherever you're rendering to is network accessible. Um, I like to submit the Blender scene with the job, and uh, there's a lot of things you can do on job completion, and if we look at integration here, this is where you integrate between Shotgun and F-Track. Uh, we're not going to mess around with that. We'll go ahead and submit that job. It takes just a minute because it's copying the .blend file up to the repository, but eventually you get back this submission results. Uh, succeeded, so uh, our job's been succeeded. Let's take a look at how we then monitor that job. So if we go over here to the uh, deadline monitor, let's fire it up on the client machine. And it runs a little bit slower here because uh, of course we're, we're going over the network. Uh, so from the client, here it is starting up. And you can actually see uh, here are the different jobs that are going on. So this one's actually rendering. Um, and, and in fact, it's actually completed uh, a frame already because I've lowered the sampling count down fast enough that we can kind of demonstrate here. Um, but if we want to take a look at those, uh, you can actually view the output here or you can explore the output uh, directly in a folder. So uh, here's those two PNG files that have just been rendered. Again, pretty seamless to get those. Uh, mostly because we're running Windows across the board here. But if we look at the deadline monitor, it gives us a, a lot of different options. We can see both of our two nodes, render nodes, uh, in the list here. We can come up here and take a look at, for example, all the different types of submission scripts from the different applications that deadline supports. Uh, if we go into uh, tools, we can go into super user mode. Uh, that gives us the ability to do things like uh, run farm reports and take a look at, for example, what systems have been executing the most. You could define pools and groups, which are ways to group systems together, either by performance or maybe their desktops versus servers or your own internal servers versus cloud-based servers. Uh, you can configure your different cloud providers. So this uh, goes back to what I was talking about before, where you can configure uh, credentials for things like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Servers and lots of other options. Um, in terms of uh, monitoring the systems themselves, you can actually go in here and view things like slave reports where you can look at, for example, uh, the, the job I just submitted and you can see really detailed output, like uh, Blender standard out that you would normally get uh, in the Blender console if you're running a render job from the command line. 
And that's pretty much it. So uh, that is rendering from Blender to Deadline in Amazon Web Services. And uh, I'm hoping that by the time you watch this video, I know that uh, Thinkbox has opened the automatic cloud provisioning feature to public beta. So if you're interested in that, I suggest you contact them and take a look. Let's talk for a few minutes about the type of cycles performance you can get from the setup. For my testing, I used a 360 frame turntable of a work in progress Blender model, and the model was rendered at HD at 1000 samples using ambient occlusion and freestyle for mesh wires. What you see in the orange chart here is render times seen from my local Blender workstation hardware and from various EC2 instance types compared along with the cost per hour and the total cost for all 360 frames. The instance type named Whopper is my local home system, and it's a name that some of you guys might recognize from the movie War Games. It's a decent spec system with uh, three NVIDIA GTX Titan GPUs and a six core 12 thread Intel i7 processor. The instance types starting with C are compute optimized EC2 instance types. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the C3 are the legacy compute optimized types, and the G2 is a GPU based EC2 instance type that's in the list for price comparison, but uh, I ran out of time and didn't get it to work. The GPU instance uses an NVIDIA grid with multiple CUDA cores, so uh, it's at a pretty attractive price point, and I'd really love to uh, t target it for future testing. So in the top middle of the chart, you'll see the frame render time and the job render time columns where you can see the time each of these computers took to render a single frame and to render all of the frames in the animation. As expected, local CPU rendering is demolished by local GPU rendering. However, cloud CPU rendering with its multiple render nodes makes a pretty good showing against the Whopper triple GPU setup. The nice thing about introducing cloud rendering is that you can break up your job and render some of it locally and some of it in the cloud. With the performance stats shown here, the job render time would be cut in half. I should note that Amazon offers AWS instances at high cost, which they call reserved, at medium cost, which they call on demand, and at low cost, which they call spot pricing. The costs shown here are for on demand pricing, so middle of the price tier. And the C3 8x large instance type running in Northern California tends to be in a more expensive region. So uh, they're also running Windows, which as I mentioned earlier, has additional cost. This configuration represents a fairly high cost scenario and you could definitely get cheaper with the same functionality. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about a free and open source software solution for doing something similar called Brenda. Brenda was first announced at the 2013 Blender conference where James Yonan, who's one of the founders of OpenVPN, presented on the solution in Amsterdam. His young son was creating animations in Blender and they found that their home PC was not powerful enough to render the, the animations. So James wrote about a thousand lines of Python code to instantiate Amazon EC2 machine instances running Blender that retrieve a render job and then render via command line. And you'll find a link to that original presentation below this video. The fact that we have an open source solution to do this is pretty cool unto itself. However, the genius of Brenda and what makes it more advantageous than other solutions is that it enables the use of the Amazon AWS spot market. The Amazon spot market is something akin to the commodities market where customers can bid for low cost computing resources, which are not being used more on that in just a bit. I'll tell you up front that if the Linux command line scares you, that you may find the learning curve a little steep. The purpose of this presentation and resources that I'll show later is to lower that learning curve and make James's excellent solution more accessible. I believe this solution is really great for small studios and individuals who prefer open source software and want to get into cloud rendering. The simplified installation steps look like the following. First, you install a local instance of Linux and Brenda with supporting software libraries. Second, you build an EC2 image in AWS with Blender and Brenda. And then third, you query the current spot pricing for EC2 instance types that you're interested in, and then populate an AWS work queue with render tasks. And then fourth, you secure the spot instances and launch the render. Let's look at the solution in just a little bit more detail. Firstly, let's talk about EC2 spot pricing. 
As I mentioned earlier, there are three tiers to EC2 pricing. The highest cost tier is called reserved instances, where customers can be assured of compute availability. The medium cost tier is the one most used, and that's the on-demand instance type, where you can request and receive computing power, and most organizations keep their own logic for when and how those instances are requested on demand. The lowest cost tier of AWS computing are spot instances. With spot instances, you're basically making a deal with Amazon to take the computing power that they have laying around unused and use it for as long as they don't need it. Should customers of other tiers request your spot instances, Amazon will terminate your instance at that time and you will not be charged for the current hour of your computer time. When you put in a request to use a spot instance, you specify a maximum amount you'd like to pay per hour. And Amazon compares that with bids from other users and the available instances before your allocated computing resources. This means that if you're doing overnight or weekend renders already, you'll have a good chance of getting instances at low costs. The issue with spot instances, of course, is that they can be killed at any time. This is where Brenda comes into play. James has designed Brenda to be resilient to the AWS spot terminating model. And should all of your instances be terminated, they'll resume them once computing resources are available for the price of your original bid. Brenda uses the simple queuing service for that resiliency. And render commands are queued up, and when instances come online, they check the queue for render work. They only remove a frame render from the queue when it's complete, and thus, if they're terminated, another render instance can pick it up. The solution also makes use of the Amazon S3 storage service. You can think about this service as an industrial version of Dropbox or Microsoft OneDrive or Google Drive. The interface to it is primitive by consumer standards, but the service is the storage backend of millions of websites and has really proven itself as high performance and secure. I'll take a moment here to point out that in my day job, I've been an information security consultant for 25 years, and I can tell you that the IT environments of major cloud security providers are as secure or more secure than most internal IT environments. If you're really dealing with confidential content, then you need to pay attention to the security configuration, but the platform itself is really not an area of concern. And of course, for those who don't use the command line much, Secure Shell or SSH is the way to get a command line interface to remote Linux computers. Brenda Python scripts are grouped into the following main applications, which are used to set up, run, and then monitor your renders. The first three scripts are used commonly when managing a Brenda render farm. The fourth script is used internally by Brenda on each render instance. And then the last script in this list is used to manage the persistent storage of your render instances in the cloud. I didn't use this last script during my testing, but I have use cases for it. So let's do a quick walkthrough of the first three scripts. Brenda Work populates the AWS queue with render tasks to execute. You'll queue up both full frame renders and subframe renders if your renders take a very long time to compute. Brenda Run lets you query spot pricing and then instantiate render instances when you're ready to go. Brenda, Brenda Tool is a nifty utility that lets you execute commands across all render nodes in your farm. It also has some slick performance evaluation capability that lets you determine which AWS instance type is the best fit for your job. I'm not going to drain this detailed Blenda client installation slide, but know that although it's Linux command line heavy, it's really not rocket science. I'm a Windows user, so I run Linux inside a virtual machine on my CG workstation, and that works really well. What I found during testing with Brenda was although James does a decent job of documenting Brenda on his GitHub repository, there are some missing pieces of information about missing libraries, configuration steps, and general expected knowledge about the technologies involved. While surfing Blender artist threads for more Brenda information, I discovered brendapro.com, which is a dedicated discussion forum site hosted by Todd McIntosh. The site is young, but it holds promise to be a great resource for people trying to implement Brenda. There are posts on the site by people who have done things like written extensions to Brenda scripts for cloud render baking, or creating multiple render passes with thumbnails. Anyhow, I've placed most of the information that you see here up on that site, including installing Linux into VirtualBox on Windows, and I recommend you check it out. Let's take a look at those sites right now. So uh, here's James Yonan's uh, GitHub repository. 
On this site, you'll actually find uh, a decent amount of information that uh, I'm covering in this presentation, as well as the latest version of Brenda. Um, and here's the brendapro.com site. So uh, I've navigated into the Installing Brenda forum, and on this you can find things like how to build EC2 Brenda node with the latest software, or how to install the client software on Windows VirtualBox. Brenda really only runs on Linux or Macintosh, so Windows users will have to run up a Linux box to use it properly. The next thing you need to do is to prepare S3 to receive both your packed project files and to have a place to output your rendered frames in the cloud for later retrieval. I recommend using the AWS Management Console for creating your S3 buckets for these two reasons. Because S3 buckets are flat storage, the recommended approach is to create one bucket for your .blend project files and another bucket for your frame output. I use Cloudberry Explorer, which is freeware for Windows, to transport my project files and frames back and forth between my CG workstation and the cloud. There are, of course, other command line utilities for doing the same, some of which have been created by Amazon themselves. So let's take a look at what that looks like in practice. Here, again, we're in the AWS Management Console. Uh, if we go into services here, S3 is the service that we're uh, dealing with at the moment. And you can see I've created two buckets under S3, one called STG Frame Bucket, that's my frame output bucket, and the other is STG Project Bucket, that's my project bucket where Brenda picks up my .blam files and then renders them in the cloud. This is uh, Cloudberry Labs, they're the people that make Cloudberry Explorer for Windows. Uh, let's take a look at what that application actually looks like. So on the right side, of this app, you'll see my two S3 buckets. So I've entered my Amazon credentials. I can then browse these buckets. Uh, if I look at my project bucket, here's a couple of recent projects that have been rendering in the cloud. Typically what I do is uh, right before I get ready to render, uh, I zip up my blend file because Brenda likes zipped files. I then uh, drag and drop, and uh, this will copy the selection up to the cloud uh, and then the same thing for retrieving frames. So I'm actually in the middle of uh, rendering at the moment. So let me go over to my frame bucket. As you can see, uh, these are all PNG files that are uh, exiting the rendering process. So typically what I do is I, I pick a render directory. I select all of these frames. And then I copy them by dragging and dropping. The next order of business is to create and edit the .brenda.com file, which is a client-side configuration file which controls the behavior of Brenda. You'll see from this slide that there are a number of options you can put into this file which shorten your work on the Linux command line when pricing, starting, and monitoring jobs. For example, the preferred EC2 instance type, the S3 bucket names and project file, the render task queue name, the instant shutdown behavior when done rendering, the Amazon Geographic Zone to run in, and the pre-configured machine image to use when instantiating render nodes, or possibly the SSH key to use to authenticate the client to the render nodes. Todd on Brenda Pro mentioned that this, his Brenda configuration file was once set to not shut down on completion, and his many render nodes were left running for a long time, clocking up a pretty sizable bill. The next step is to populate the Brenda work queue with render tasks. Render tasks can be thought of as a render job broken up into multiple Blender command line instructions. If you have a thousand frame render animation specified in your .blend, then you could run a Brenda script to create 1,000 render tasks in the queue, with each task sequence telling Blender to render a single frame. If you'd like to spread out your single frame render job across multiple render nodes, you can do that also. James has included a Brenda task script template for both full frame and subframe output. And finally, you can check the SQS work queue at any time to find out the status of your render job. If you've started a thousand frame render job and 500 frames remain in the queue, you know you're halfway finished. Let's look at what that looks like in practice. So here we are again uh, on the S3 console. If we go over here, you'll notice under services, uh, we have something called uh, SQS, that's a simple queuing service, and I have created an SQS work queue called work queue. Uh, as it turns out, I'm actually rendering at the moment, so uh, there are 37 of 300 
uh, queue tasks uh, that were queued up through 37 re remaining and there's uh, eight in flight. So you can check your status at just about any time. And of course, finally, pricing and rendering a Blender Cycles project. The first step is checking EC2 pricing, which is done via the Brenda run command and specifying an instance type. If you omit the dash i instance type flag, the default instance type from your .brenda.com file will be used. I string several of these commands together into a shell script for various compute optimized instance types. That way I can get a price for all instance types at once. Instantiating instance types is also done with the brenda run command. Several flags are worth noting here, including the minus n flag, which tells AWS how many instances to instantiate, the minus p flag, which tells AWS the maximum price you're willing to pay for an EC2 instance of the specified type. If the hourly instance price goes above this price, your instance will be terminated, and the minus p capital P flag will be used to tell AWS to make the spot request persistent. So when the instance price drops back down to your maximum price, your instances will be reprovisioned. Once the instance is running, the Brenda tool command can be used to execute SSH commands across the instances to check status or execute commands. I find myself using these right after kicking off a render job to make sure that Blender is actually rendering correctly, and then I can continue monitoring the status of the render job via the AWS mobile client. If you need to cancel a request for render instances, Brenda run command can do that too. Okay, that's enough theory. Let's check out what the solution actually looks like in practice. Okay, let's take you through the workflow of what it looks like to use Brenda to do some cloud rendering of a typical Blender project. Uh, what you're seeing here is the output of a really great tutorial by Nick Brenner, uh, sorry, Nick Brunis. Uh, there was a uh, post of this up on Blender Nation back in January, and he calls it his winter special tutorial. He creates this uh, snowy forest scene. Um, he actually supplies uh, some of the models for this, and um, it's basically a tutorial to create a, a single image uh, rather than an animated sequence. So I thought, what a, a great opportunity to create an animated flyover and use some cloud rendering uh, to do some high-resolution rendering of that. So we're going to make some minor tweaks to the file here. Uh, first of all, we're going to switch from GPU rendering to CPU because, again, we're sending it up to the cloud uh, where it's going to be rendered using CPUs. We're going to keep it at 1080p. Uh, what we might do, um, I'll just show you briefly here, if you enable the stamp option and uh, you select all of these different stamp information types, what Blender does with stamp, if you've never used this feature before, is that it stamps the information directly into the image. So when you bring up the image in a PNG viewer, you'll actually see uh, some rather ugly text stamped over your beautiful image which is great for test rendering, but uh, I usually forget to disable it <laughs> and then I end up cursing myself. Uh, so uh, what I've learned as part of this process is Blender will actually, if you select these options and disable stamp, Blender will actually stamp this stuff into the PNG header information, which is really great because there's tools like XF tool and so forth you can use then to uh, view that information. So if you're cloud rendering, this can be really handy, right? You could send uh, 100 frames up to the cloud, and this render time in particular is really handy for determining how long that image took to render. And then from there, you can do things like, you know, average what different instance types are doing uh, in terms of times to render. So really handy. Uh, I'm going to take this and maybe reduce the uh, render samples down to about 200 uh, just for the interest of uh, trying to get some output from our cloud farm. Uh, pretty quickly. So, okay, so these settings are pretty good. Uh, maybe even, this is a 400 frame animation. I might even just uh, reduce this down to maybe like 100 frames. Okay, so uh, with that, let's go ahead and just save that out to disk. So I'm going to save that as uh, winter landscape 24 cpu.blend. Then we go out to the file system. We find that file and we zip it up. So I'm going to use 7-zip. Uh, we'll zip that up to winter landscape 24 CPU blend zip uh, again uh, Brenda likes seeing uh, archived zip files uh, Which kind of reduces the amount of time it takes to move the file around within the render cloud and back and forth to the render cloud We're then going to take uh, we'll go ahead and refresh here. So again, we have our cloudberry uh, Explorer for Amazon s3 
Um, we're going to take that and if you remember, what we have is two S3 buckets here. Here's our SDG project bucket. I'm going to go into that. I'm going to grab our zip file and I'm just going to drag it and drop it between the two. So uh, what you'll notice is um, this uploads it in a couple of megabits per second. You can see down here on the status bar, we're, we're getting about 2.5 megabits per second. So it happens pretty quick. Um, obviously, download happens a lot quicker. So if you're downloading, you know, a thousand frames, it, it really only takes a matter of minutes, really. So here's our, uh, our file up on the cloud. Uh, what I'm going to do out here is just capture this file name, uh, which we're going to use it going to do a control C uh, so we could use it in our next step. Okay, so uh, the next thing we do is we're going to jump into our Ubuntu uh, VirtualBox machine image. I use Oracle VirtualBox, which is a free virtualization desktop package to allow you to run any operating system in a virtual machine on any other operating system. It's pretty neat technology. Um, I have uh, information on brendapro.com you could use uh, as well as in this presentation deck, which I'll, I'll try and post online on how to run up that VirtualBox instance. Let's go ahead and just log in quickly. Uh, and then uh, we'll fire up a terminal here. So uh, the first thing we want to do is uh, I'll just do a, a quick ls on the, the file directory. And you'll notice there's a couple of files in here that I've placed after installing Brenda locally on this workstation uh, that are interesting. Uh, the first of which is a Brenda, let's see. We'll do a uh, gedit of dot brenda dot conf. Uh, this is the Brenda configuration file. And you'll notice a couple things in here. So, uh, you know, first of all, our instance uh, type is specified. Secondly, uh, <laughs> you can see I've been doing some rendering lately of other project files. We'll go ahead and put in the project file that uh, we're executing now. Uh, we have our Brenda work queue. We have the bucket that the render output's going into. Uh, we have our preferred region, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is James Yonan's original AMI. Uh, so he published a, a public AMI, which you could use to uh, basically run up your render cloud instances. Now, uh, because James created this back in 2013, the, the Blender version is pretty old, and the, the Linux version is uh, getting a little long in the tooth. So uh, what I've been doing is I, uh, first of all, I, I updated his AMI and I started playing around with it. Uh, and then I realized, you know, it's probably better if I just create my own AMI. So what I did, what I did was I ran up my own Ubuntu server AMI and I just keep uh, kind of updating that. And this is the latest iteration of that. Um, again, the instructions for how to do this are both in the stack and then they're up on brendapro.com. Uh, so the important thing to note is that you specify your AMI uh, ID in here. So I'm going to go ahead and just save this. And we'll close gedit. Now, uh, the second thing I'm going to do is uh, just show what it looks like to populate a work queue. So uh, again, the, the tools that we use for that are Brenda work. If you want to see the, the syntax of that, you just do a minus H. Um, OK, so let's do a, a Brenda work. Uh, and we're going to say minus T. Now, as a, as a matter of fact, let's see. So, yeah, um, before I show you that real quick, let me just show you, um, if I do another LS minus L, you'll notice um, there's two files here. There's a, a file here called subframe, and there's a file here called frame. Now, these are included in the Brenda distribution. Uh, let me just do a cat of frame so you can see what that looks like. Uh, what I've done is, uh, this is the path on my servers to the latest version of uh, Blender, as it turns out, 2.738 at the time of this tutorial. Uh, and uh, it's issuing a command, so uh, running Blender on the command line with background, uh, specifying the dot .blend. Uh, the output type is going to be PNG. Here's the output directory. It's using some variables uh, to create those, uh, out those files in the output directory. And uh, it's specifying the start and the end frame, which again are, are variables uh, that it gets from elsewhere. It's doing a step of one, so it steps forward one frame, and so on and so forth. I've added some other uh, command line options here for you know auto executing uh, scripts because I like to add the hash frame into my files. So uh, in case you're not familiar with that, uh, down here under the the render settings, uh, there's a seed value. If you type uh, if you type uh, hash frame, 
into this, uh, what you'll get is your, your seed value will be set to whatever frame that you're on. So you'll see uh, as you jump around, it'll actually uh, use a different seed value for each frame as it renders. And what that gives you is it uh, creates a kind of a randomization of the noise, the cycle's noise. So as you lower your number of samples, you'll get cycles kind of graininess. And um, this will vary the graininess with a different seed value for each frame. And that creates kind of a, it's almost a film grain. I, I look at it as a feature. Um, so that's pretty handy. Anyways, you need to execute auto Python scripts to make that happen. Okay, so that's our, our frame. And uh, the second thing that we're gonna do Okay, so the, the second thing we're going to do here, we'll just make sure we're still re recording. Yep. Okay, so uh, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to do a Brenda-work, and uh, we're going to uh, populate that by specifying dash T uh, frame. So we're going to use that frame task script. Uh, we're going to say our uh, first uh, frame is going to be 1. Our end frame is going to be 100. And uh, we're going to push that out to uh, the simple queuing service, which is part of Amazon Web Services. So as you can see, it's creating 100 different Blender command line tasks for those 100 frames. And we can actually uh, check that by doing a Brenda, oh, it's Brenda work status. And that comes back and says there's 100 tasks queued. All right, so at this point, we're ready to do uh, a price, uh, which if we look in uh, the home directory here, I'll just do a, a cat of dot slash price dash run. Uh, so you guys can, whoops. Oh, right, cat of price run dot sh. Uh, and all that's doing is executing uh, a couple of different Brenda run commands. So specifying different instance types. So let's see what the output of that looks like. So price, uh, let's see, dash, um, dash run dot sh. And what that's doing is that that's using the Amazon API to go out to this particular region and just price out what each of these instances is costing. Now what I've noticed, uh, this C4 8x large is um, one of the largest instance types that compute optimized instance types that Amazon offers, and uh, that is the um, it's the latest generation of Intel processor in that system. And so what you'll see is the prices range basically from uh, 35 cents an hour, which is is pretty high, uh, all the way down to you know 25 cents an hour, almost 26 cents an hour. Now, if you want to see at uh, like what historic instance pricing looks like. If you go over here in the Blender, uh, oh, sorry, in the Amazon Web Services console, we'll go over here to Spot Requests and take a look at pricing history. Uh, so we select our uh, machine type. In this case, let's see, it's a C4 8x large, and it'll give you uh, the pricing history of those systems at spot pricing over the course of you know, one one day, one week, one month. Uh, it gives you a, a pretty good idea for what those systems go for. And so obviously you want to be uh, requesting them at the lowest possible price you can get them for. You know, there are times when the pricing jumps all the way up. Let's take a look here. So you can see some of these systems are priced at uh, $7.42 per hour, which in spot pricing terms, that's incredibly high. And there's a good chance that Amazon is just trying to reserve those instances for themselves. So they're trying to <laughs> discourage people from bidding on those. But at the same uh, time, there were 25 cent instances. So in general, uh, I find that your spot price uh, tends to be pretty consistent uh, across time. And uh, what I've done is I've included uh, in the links that I've provided with this session, a video from Amazon that explains AWS spot pricing strategies. And uh, they get pretty sophisticated. So uh, it's well worth taking a look. All right, so back to Linux here. And uh, I think what we'll see is, uh, just make sure we're still recording. Yep, looks like we are. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do here, now that we have a, a set of pricing, 
is uh, we'll go ahead and, and instantiate a render job. So we're gonna go, uh, well, before I do that, let me jump out here to Amazon Web Services and just show you. So here's my currently stopped instances. You'll notice uh, these are just test systems that I'm adjusting configuration on them before I, I take a snapshot and turn them into AMIs. But you'll notice that they're uh, set to these micro T1, T2 micro instance types. And that's because these instance types are free. Amazon gives you a certain amount of run hours for these instance types when you sign up for an AWS account. So you actually don't get charged. And so selecting these instance types when you're just playing around or when you're getting things configured, uh, you could avoid getting charged at all. But again, all of these are stopped uh, and I currently have no spot requests. So let's, let's go ahead and start a spot request. I'm gonna jump back here. I'm gonna type uh, Brenda run minus I and specify a C4 8x large. I'm going to specify the number of them with the uh, dash n and you know in this case let's just choose four. Uh, I'm going to specify and and while I'm doing that it brings up a very interesting point on limits. So if we look on limits here uh, there's a, a certain number of limits that on how many of these systems you can spawn. Um, by default, Amazon limits uh, the number of instances you can request. And the reason they do that is that, uh, you know, any um, uh, cyber criminal who manages to get a credit card, they really don't want them running up like a thousand machines to run a botnet on their system. So what they do is, and, and they also don't want you as you're playing around for the first time with their system to run up a, a thousand dollar bill on your Amazon account just on accident. So. Uh, what they do is they, they limit. You can now uh, request a larger instance limit, and that's what I've done here. So uh, I have a hundred machines I could run up. So if you know, if we're uh, dealing with C4 8x large, that's a uh, hundred different instances of those, each with 36 processors each. That's a lot of computing power, right? So what we're going to demonstrate here is uh, much lower than that. We're just going to do four. So we'll specify four, we'll give it a maximum price we're willing to pay of dot, uh, we'll give it a like dot uh, 27 cents an hour. Uh, we're gonna specify that it's persistent and uh, we're gonna specify spot. So let's go ahead and issue that. And this is what a successful spot instance request looks like. So again, you could see here's the AMI that we're using, here's the maximum bid price. It's persistent, the instance type, there's four of them. Uh, and then if we come all the way down here, you'll see these are the actual spot instance request uh, unique IDs. Uh, we can actually check that by doing a Brenda run status. That shows us um, there's our spot request. So I'm just going to do date to get a timestamp here. And I'm going to do a countdown 300. All right. so. Um, you'll see the status as pending evaluation. That means that um, this spot request is actually going through Amazon's provisioning process. So uh, it takes, I've found, you know, upwards of five minutes for that uh, request to make it all the way through the provisioning process. We can actually see the spot request now if we go over here in the Amazon Web Console. You can see um, these requests are open, they're pending fulfillment. That means uh, Amazon services are basically thinking about it. Uh, but haven't quite uh, provisioned them. And, and we'll uh, just pause the video now and resume uh, once that four minutes is up. So we're back. Uh, we've done a, a quick countdown here. Let's, let's go ahead and do a Brenda run status. Uh, and what you'll see here is active instances. Uh, the spot request that we sent out to Amazon Web Services has now been fulfilled. And you'll actually see that change also, uh, in the spot request here, we'll just do a quick browser refresh. All right. So those um, C4 8x large instances that we requested are now active. If we go over here to our instances tab, you'll actually see uh, those systems are up and running. Uh, you can actually just uh, check them. Let's say we'll just grab these four here and we'll go over to monitoring. Uh, and whoops, 
Um, so let's see. I like to look at uh, CPU utilization. That's always a really nice one. But it takes just a minute for these uh, um, statistics to start to gather. So we'll, we'll give those just a bit. In the meantime, let's jump back to our uh, command line and we'll just do a quick uh, Brenda dash uh, tool SSH uptime. Now, if you're a Linux head, you're probably familiar with the uh, uptime command. Uh, what we're basically issuing here is just a, an SSH command across all four instances to check on uptime. And that tells us how long the system's been up, what the, uh, what the average load is. Um, these systems take just a, a little time to come up. Let's, let's do another Brenda command here. Brenda tool SSH tail log. And uh, what this goes out and does is it grabs standard out from each of these four systems. And so what you'll see is if you're familiar with Blender command line rendering, uh, this might look really familiar to you. So um, here, this system's working on frame two, this one's working on frame one, frame nine, frame four. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's really interesting uh, how they pick the frames off of the stack, but uh, I can assure you that each system only picks one frame from the stack and uh, they don't contend for them. You can also see the time remaining. So uh, it looks like uh, these frames are going to take about uh, five minutes to render. So maybe I should have lowered my sample count for this demo. And you can see, you know, it's path tracing these particular tiles. And you can uh, do some interesting stuff here. Like, let's see, well, uh, if we go lines equals, well, we'll say like uh, 100. Uh, you can actually go back into the uh, the log file and, and and actually see these systems. That that brings up a hundred lines from each, or maybe even add another zero there and do a thousand. You can go all the way back and see on each of these systems. Uh, see, let's see, this is this particular system. It's going back all the way through these cloud tracing, all the way through these tile tracing lines. Uh, okay, we didn't go back far enough. Okay, so there's 2,000 tiles. So uh, yeah, uh, basically we'd need to go back uh, probably about 3,000 lines to actually see that system starting up. But you, trust me, you can go back and see the system booting, see it receiving uh, Brenda script command, seeing it, see it pick uh, things off the stack and so forth. Now, um, as we watch these systems render, uh, we can actually... Um, Go ahead, uh, let's go back to the Amazon Web Services console here and uh, see what we can see there. Let's see. Okay, so uh, what we're looking at here is <laughs> different systems uh, basically showing their CPU utilization. As you can expect, it's it's kind of nailed at 100%. Let's, let's go ahead and uh, close that. We'll just select a couple of these individually. So uh, here's our, our first system here. So we'll look at this one here. So uh, 100%, 100%, uh, we're on this one here. Let's say CPU utilization. Again, we're almost at 100%. It takes a little while for these cloud metrics to, to start to scale up so you can see them appropriately. But uh, these systems are basically now rendering. So uh, if we jump out to our Linux box again and just issue a, a Brenda tail log, let's take a look at where we sit. Okay, uh, so some of them are all the way down to uh, basically uh, two minutes. So um, while the systems are rendering, let's, let's go ahead and uh, jump out to the file system. I'll just uh, show you uh, what some of that render output looks like. And, and actually, um, while we're doing it, I'm just going to explain the uh, EXIF tool, which I mentioned earlier. So uh, the EXIF tool is a really fantastic utility uh, written by Phil Harvey that reads and writes metadata from image files. So if you take photographs, you'll be familiar with EXIF data, which indicates in the file metadata what your lens type is. You know what your aperture was. Um, you know what shutter speed you use. That kind of thing. Well, the PNG stamp information uh, is written out as metadata, and the EXIF tool is a really great way to check that out. Uh, now, because 
everybody loves a GUI. Uh, somebody has written an EXIF tool GUI that just uses this command line to find out that information. So I thought I'd show you kind of what that looks like. So here's a couple of frames that I'd rendered out from the cloud. And what's interesting, if you uh, select them and you select all metadata, is down here, uh, you can actually see uh, some of the custom PNG information that we added to the file. So um, this is information from Blender, right? So here's the, the file, here's when I rendered it, uh, here's the actual render time. And I, I find this really interesting. So this particular frame uh, looks like it took, uh, what is that? That's milliseconds uh, and then uh, minutes and hours. Uh, milliseconds, seconds, minutes. I think we're looking at one minute, 53 seconds for this frame. Either that or it's one hour and 53 seconds. So I'll have to go back to Blender to try to figure that out. But you know, the important thing is you can figure out what your instances are, what the render time is for each instance. And, and of course you can just do a SSH tail log and uh, figure it out as well. But you know, if you wanna fire and forget and then come back and check these things in the morning, I think that's a really handy tool to use. Okay, so let's just check how we're doing. So we're down to 53 seconds. Uh, and uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just jump out to uh, the file system here and I'll show you one more thing uh, while we're at it. So let's see, if we jump out here to winter landscape, uh, I'll show you uh, one of the other renders that I did previously. Uh, I had forgotten to disable the uh, compositing uh, feature of Blender. So what you're seeing here is some subframe rendering, which we'll get into in just a moment. Uh, but you can actually tell Blender use a hundred different cloud computers to each render a tile of a single image. And uh, that's pretty nifty, uh, but you want to be sure you disable the compositing aspect of the blend file. So in this case, um, I had, I think it was a mild vignette uh, was being applied to this image. Uh, and because each one of these tiles applied it, uh, you, what you're getting is this kind of, you can see the, the seams, hopefully you can see the seams of each one of the tiles. Um, not good. Uh, what you really want to get is something like this, which when they're stitched together, it just looks very seamless. Okay, so let's go ahead and check our status one more time. All right, down to seven seconds on some of these frames. All right, and that, what this tells me is that some of those systems have finished rendering. So I usually at this point go out to Cloudberry Explorer, go into my frame bucket, uh, do a quick refresh, and what you'll see is some frames show up. So uh, we'll go back to this winter landscape directory, uh, pick a render directory. Um, in this case, I'm gonna jump to render 21. I'm just going to transfer these frames. As you can tell, they're uh, 10, megabit, 10 megabytes each, uh, 10 and a half. I'm just going to go ahead and move these over. Again, you can see the speed here. We're at about uh, three, five, six. So it's, it's increasing. I was getting extremely fast transfer speeds. So again, transferring back and forth to the cloud is really not your, your biggest holdup. And we'll go out here to the render directory go into render 21 and there you can see these files are being rendered appropriately. Obviously there's not a great number of samples here, so it's a, not the best image quality we can get, but uh, because we're cloud rendering, uh, we can actually do that. And let's jump back out to uh, take a look. And you can actually see, you know, here we are graphing CPU utilization on the system. So you can also see disk reads, writes, and a number, number of other stats. Okay, and uh, I think the last thing that um, I'd like to show you guys, just because we're, I want to show you subframe rendering, is to do a, a Brenda run minus T and stop. So this will uh, actually stop all of those systems and cancel the spot request for them. So if you go back uh, into your instances screen in the Amazon Web Services Console, you'll see these systems are now shutting down. So really handy for testing, really handy if uh, you start rendering frames uh, and then you check one of your PNGs and you notice something's wrong and you have a hundred instances rendering, you know, this will shut them all down. So uh, just to recap on the cost that we've, uh, you know, incurred as part of this test, each one of these C4 ADEX larges uh, are running at a maximum of roughly about a quarter US, so 25 cents. 
So um, this entire render process, if we left it running for an hour, would cost us about a dollar. And again, uh, you can use smaller instances uh, with less than 36 processors and 60 gigs of RAM, and uh, it'll cost you less. Okay, let's take a look at what it looks like to do some multi-frame rendering using Brenda and Blender. So uh, I'm gonna just show you here. This is a, a, a project uh, to create a one ring. Uh, this is based on a really excellent tutorial by a gentleman named uh, Jovlem. I think I'm hopefully pronouncing that correctly. Uh, there was a post uh, just a you know a couple weeks ago on how to create this using Blender. Uh, pretty nifty, super short, 15, I think it was 15 minutes was the whole tutorial. Um, the nice thing is that uh, this forced me to go out and try to figure out what this lettering was that he used um, because he didn't provide the image file for the displacement of the emission on the outside of this ring. Uh, so I went to uh, a website and found out this is actually Tangwar is the script, the Elder script, and uh, I used a English to Tangwar uh, translator to actually write a custom inscription on my version of the ring to my wife. So uh, on the inside of the ring it has one message, on the outside it has another. Um, anyways, fun tutorial, highly recommend it. Let's see how we can render this file, which uh, I think this particular render is um, UHD, so it's, uh, it's a 4K render at many different samples. I think I rendered this at like 5,000 samples. How we can put that up into the cloud and render it as a single image, but use tiles and Brenda to make that happen. So uh, first things first, uh, let's go ahead and take this Blender file and just prepare it for cloud-based rendering. So uh, this is actually a, a turntable render. Um, I've just lowered it down to one frame. Let's let's go ahead and uh, change this from Open EXR Multilayer, which I'm finding is extremely handy for doing cloud rendering. So uh, even though these files are huge, you know they're in the order of 500 megs per frame. Uh, what I'm finding is that you can do things like uh, select every single pass you would ever possibly want, uh, and then render out your frames that way. And then if you want to do any post rendering compositing locally, you can just open up that frame sequence and access any one of those layers. So really handy. Um, in this case, we're just going to use uh, PNG. Uh, so the other thing uh, that I'll do just in the interest of making for uh, an interesting demo that finishes on time without pausing the video too much, I'm going to reduce the samples down to 250, uh, and hopefully that'll, um, that'll render pretty quickly. So um, let's see. Next thing is uh, we'll go ahead and jump onto our Linux system. So we'll log in there. Uh, and then uh, what we're going to do is just open the uh, Brenda comp file. So uh, we'll go we'll do gedit.brenda.conf. And uh, we're going to need, whoops, what's going on here? Ah, strange display stuff. Okay, uh, so we're going to need to modify the, the project file. So the first thing we do is uh, we take this project, uh, we're going to save it out, we'll call it Ring of Power CPU 09. Uh, we'll go ahead and save that. And then um, down here in the file system, We'll take that same file just like we did before. Uh, we will compress that to ring of power 09.zip. Um, moderate savings there. And then uh, as usual, we will, let's see, we'll go over here to models, grab that zip file, jump into our project bucket, and uh, we'll go ahead and we'll just push that up to Amazon S3. So in our .brenda.com file, uh, let's go ahead and we'll edit the project file. So we'll go up here to the Blender project line and we'll forgot to grab that project file. So we'll go ahead and grab that straight from the directory. Uh, we will replace this, save that file out, close it down. Okay, so uh, we're gonna do this a, a little bit different. Uh, first of all, I think we might still have uh, some things sitting in the queue. Yes, we do. So uh, this gives me a good opportunity to kind of show you how Brenda work uh, has a, an option here where we can do a, a Brenda uh, dash work and do a reset. So what that does is that uh, uses an API to the Amazon Web Services 
simple queuing service to actually uh, clear that queue for us. So because there's a hundred tasks in there, it's going to take a little while to complete. Uh, and then we'll run Brenda work status. And sure enough, we have zero queued task. So that's great. Let's go ahead and populate that Brenda work queue. So um, before I do that, uh, what I wanted to do is just show you uh, if we do a cat uh, subframe. So this is a subframe task script that's included in Brenda. And what it does is it, it effectively takes your image and it splits it into X and Y regions. Uh, and then uh, it'll issue the same uh, Blender command line, but it'll use uh, these different variables for X and Y to create tiles for the frame. So you can do this subframe rendering. Let's see what that looks like from a Brenda work perspective. We do uh, Brenda, well, let's just clear the screen to make it a little, make it a little easier for folks to see. So we'll do a, a Brenda dash work uh, minus T. We're going to specify the uh, subframe task script uh, template. Uh, we'll do a, let's see, uh, the end frame will make it one. And uh, here's where we get to specify the X and Y tile size. So we can break things up into five, 10, however many tiles we want. Let's, let's go ahead and use 10 for this. So we're going to say 10 by 10. And then uh, we'll do a push and see what that does. So as you can see, it's going through and it's creating tasks uh, for this one frame. Uh, for each one of those tiles. If we do a Brenda work status, you could see there's a, a hundred different tiles, right? That's probably overkill for our 1080p image, but uh, you know, at least it gives us something interesting to look at while we're doing the demo. Um, so as usual, we're going to do a, uh, a price run dot, whoops, run dot sh. We'll just take a look at the, uh, Pricing. I always like to, before I kick off these jobs, just check and make sure the pricing is still something rational. Uh, the Amazon Web Services have been known to have pricing runs on them, so uh, the prices sometimes go up to crazy amounts. It's not very often it happens. They try to control the market to make sure that doesn't happen. But as you can see, our price of $0.27 cents per hour for C4 8x large is still pretty valid. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, maybe issue a, let's see, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll issue a, a Brenda run command to uh, maybe use those uh, same systems, but this time uh, for our sub frame rendering. So we'll just do a copy, we'll do a paste there. Okay, so we're gonna use four systems uh, we're going to uh, put our maximum, keep our maximum bid price at 27 cents an hour, and we're going to make sure it's spot pricing. Uh, let's go ahead and issue that command. Okay, I'm going to do a, a countdown 300. This is just a little script, uh, shell script that I wrote that uh, tells me when five minutes is up because uh, otherwise I keep checking and Amazon is provisioning and it, and it takes a long time. So while we're waiting for that five minutes to be up, uh, I want to just say a, a few moments, uh, say a few things about Image Magic. Image Magic is a command line utility. It's actually a set of command line utilities that allow you to do image manipulation. And uh, don't let this uh, very 1980s looking, GeoCities looking website fool you. Uh, this tool is extremely powerful. And uh, there's a number of different script examples for uh, command line processing of image files. So what we're going to use it for is to take a bunch of discrete PNG files that are outputted from our render job and uh, merge them together into a single PNG file. Um, and it's, it's pretty straightforward to do that. Um, what I would really like to see is for somebody, hopefully somebody um, listening to this session and uh, with a little better scripting uh, knowledge than I have, write uh, a Windows PowerShell script that will go through uh, a series of, of these tile files, merge them using image magic, but do that across multiple frames in an animation sequence. So we're demonstrating right here what it looks like for a single static image, uh, but we really could use some client-side scripts to help kind of recombine those. 
and uh, Todd McIntosh, who runs Brenda Pro, Pro and I, brendapro.com and I were kind of having a discussion about whether this is best suited for the cloud or whether it's best suited for uh, the desktop. You know, I, I think it, it it takes very little time to recombine these images on the desktop and very little compute power. So I think this is really a script that's best written for the uh, for the command line on the client system. Okay, so while that's kicking off, uh, let me show you a, a couple of other things here. So, uh, you know, the snowy winter landscape flyover, I just wanted to show you kind of what that turned out looking like. So pretty nifty. Uh, this is what the robot that we saw earlier in the demo showed up like. Obviously my uh, freestyle skills <laughs> probably need some improvement. All right, so you get the picture. So uh, that, that robot, by the way, is still a work in progress. Uh, again, just did blocking and basic line wire drawing uh, just to test the rendering. All right, so let's jump back to our Linux machine. We'll just take a look. All right, we still have about a minute left. Let's jump out here to the Amazon Web Console and you can see what that looks like. So um, what Amazon does is this is our prior request that we use to uh, render that winter landscape scene. And you can see that they're canceled. They're, they're actually ghosted in the console for a uh, certain number of time uh, before they get, uh, they eventually just disappear. So don't worry if you see these things out here, they're actually not running. Um, here's our active uh, request. So you can see it looks like they've been fulfilled. And if we look at our instances, you can actually see these are running. And again, uh, if we lower this down, you can actually see here's our C4 8x large systems that were terminated by us on the command line earlier. And you can see uh, the status check shows that they're initializing. So it takes a little while after their provision before they finally pass one or two status checks and uh, fully start rendering. Okay, so let's jump back here. All right, so 25 seconds left. So I think what we'll do here is I'm just going to break out of the shell script and I'm going to do a, a Brenda tool SSH uh, uptime and we'll just uh, that'll cause us to go out to the Amazon Web Services, check those systems, see if they're up and running and they are indeed. So uh, what we'll do is we'll do a, a Brenda tool SSH uh, tail log which will show us uh, default log output. So it looks like, uh, let's see, so we've got a couple of different messages coming from our render farm here. They're interesting. Let's see if uh, Blender fires up on all of them. Yep, Blender's up on three of the four, and it looks like uh, the fourth one is still busy coming up. And you could see actually in this output, it's uh, it's actually rendering uh, this output here. So we have an error message that's probably worth looking into, but let's take a look here. Okay, as you can see, these uh, these frames are, are rendering very quickly. And what we'll do is we'll just jump over to uh, our frame bucket and just take a look, we'll do a refresh. And sure enough, um, here are some of the frames that are being output here. So uh, what I'll do is I'll navigate to a render directory that I've set up to receive these files. We'll grab these files and uh, we'll just go ahead and drag them and drop them over. There we go. Okay, so we have these files in the, the render 7 directory, and I'll just do a, a quick DIR here, just show you what those files look like. Uh, if we wanted to look at 
a single one of those files. Let's go ahead and grab, say, this one. We'll open it using a default viewer. As you can see, uh, just the very lower left-hand frame, lower left-hand tile has been rendered in this one. So let's see what it looks like uh, to do an image magic command. But um, before we do that, I think what I'm going to do here, uh, while this is rendering, we'll just do a Brenda run status and uh, make sure. So all four of those systems are rendering. Uh, I wanted to show you another tool here, uh, Brenda. Uh, let's see, we'll do a, Brenda tool. SSH cat task underscore count. So this is a file that's uh, kept up on each of the servers. It'll tell you how many frames the server has rendered. Uh, so it looks like uh, 10 for each of these. Let's go ahead and cancel out of that. Um, well, another really handy command uh, that I like using is uh, Brenda tool, and we'll do a uh, perf. So <clears throat> what this does is uh, the Brenda tool will actually go out and look at how many frames each one of these systems has, has rendered. And the reason I'm running this now is because uh, you need to run it while your job is rendering. And what it does is it actually outputs how many tasks per hour. So if you're doing frame rendering, that would be how many frames per hour you're able to render with the current number of instances that you're running. In this case, I could run 434 frames per hour, which would give me like four frames, right? With 100 tiles per frame. Uh, and it also tells you how many, t how many frames per hour each of these systems will execute. So if you had uh, spun up a number of different instance types, you can actually then compare how many frames per hour each one of them will give you, right? Obviously, bigger systems will usually give you more frames per hour. But the other in interesting stat here that they'll give you is the number of frames per US dollar. So, uh, you know, in this case, we can actually render 400 frames because we're doing subframe rendering, that's 400 tiles per US dollar. And that is really interesting because you get some very surprising results as you look across the different instance types uh, that you could be rendering with. Okay, so uh, we'll jump back to the command line here and uh, we'll just take a look at what it looks like uh, to run some image magic commands. So once you install image magic, uh, you get this utility called convert, which is placed into the path. So uh, what I'm going to do is just do a convert uh, star.png and uh, we'll use the minus layers switch and uh, say merge those layers. And then um, what we're going to do is uh, just place the resulting output file one directory up and we'll call it a winterscape merged.png. So we run that command. It's, uh, it's actually merging. What is that? That's you know roughly about 20 different tile sizes. Uh, we'll go up one directory and just take a look here. So here's our winterscape merged. Now, you know, this is going to be an incomplete image because we grabbed the tiles before we were finished rendering all of them. But as I bring it up, you can see it's actually merging them together. So super handy, runs very fast. Uh, also um, really useful, you know, if you're rendering those giant 4K images at, you know, 10,000, 100,000 samples, who knows, full GI. Maybe it's taking you forever just to render a single frame. Uh, you could use the cloud to do that. Now, I wanted to show you one more thing. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and uh, while we're here, let's do a Brenda run. And uh, we'll go minus T uh, stop. Uh, those systems will obviously automatically stop on their own, but I'm just going to do a force. But I wanted to show you uh, one more thing, which is pretty slick. Let's, let's go ahead and uh, take this. We'll, we had this set to 4K resolution. Um, I'm going to bump this up maybe to, you know, we'll say somewhere around 5,000 samples uh, just so we can see what's happening. Now, um, what I wanted to show you was this render plus utility. 
So Render Plus is a for purchase Blender add-on that you can find in the uh, Blender Market off CG Cookie. Um, what it allows you to do is some pretty slick things around batch rendering. And since we're this is a session on rendering, I think it would be remiss not to talk about this utility. So what I really love using it for is uh, is actually doing uh, command line rendering with Blender locally on my machine. So let's let's go ahead and uh, we'll select uh, GPU compute. Uh, we will and you know if you're unfamiliar with Blender command line rendering. Uh, it's very, uh, very useful. It, it allows you to run rendering at maximum speeds for your CPU or GPU. If you do, if you just hit the render button within Blender now, uh, what you'll get is, uh, if you look at the utilization on your GPUs, um, you won't get a full 100% utilization because it's busy redrawing the screen. So every time it uh, for example, if you do a progressive refine, you get the same behavior. It's so busy going back and forth between the, the video card and your CPU and the display that uh, it actually isn't an optimal use of rendering. You don't get full speed out of your system. Command line rendering for Blender definitely is. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look and maybe take a look at what that looks like. But, um, you know, if you do rendering from the command line, uh, you have a number of different options. It's actually fairly tedious to specify the full path to your file and then the path to wherever it is you keep Blender. I actually don't install Blender. I just download daily builds and I use them from a, a directory structure that indicates uh, what the version of it is. It's really a pain to build command line renders, but it's really great to get full render speed from command line rendering. So what Render Plus allows me to do is actually just build that command line dynamically. So if I hit Render Plus, select in the background, run from inside a terminal, and I click Image, what happens is it builds uh, the render command line and then immediately uh, starts rendering it. Now, of course, it'll output this file directly to wherever you have your dot blend specifies the file output. So uh, really, really handy, I think, if you're trying to get the maximum render speed out of your system. We'll just, uh, I don't know, this will probably play hell with the recording that we're doing here, uh, but I use uh, EVGA cards. And so what I like to do is I use an EVGA utility to actually tell me what my GPU utilization is. Uh, if I double click this, there, let's see. If I double click this, let's see, we'll go down and specify, here we go. Uh, here you can actually see my GPU usage is just pegged at 99% for all three Titan cards that are in my system here. So um, super handy. Also, you know, my, uh, where is it? My GPU temperature, nice and cool. Uh, because I have liquid cooling going to those cards, again, something I also recommend. Anyways, that's Render Plus, uh, command line rendering. Obviously, not the only thing that that utility can do for you. Um, if you're really into rendering, uh, if you want to be notified with an email or have your files copied automatically up to Dropbox or shut down your system or put it into a low power state, after you're done rendering, um, really great utility. Um, it also has uh, the ability to do things like uh, run a preview, so it does an OpenGL render for you automatically. Um, the batch render, uh, if you add a batch, it allows you to do all sorts of different, uh, it's kind of wizard basically, that'll walk you through uh, everything you might wanna put into your batch file. Looks like it automatically updates RSS. I don't really use that feature, but I uh, strongly re recommend you check it out. Um, uh, once you buy it, you get free updates for life. So I have no affiliation whatsoever with the author of this tool. I just think it's really great. Okay, let's talk about Brenda performance results. So the uh, robot roundtable that I mentioned earlier, which we rendered at 1080p, uh, again, similar <laughs> results here. You'll see uh, GPU kills CPU on the local workstation. Uh, but I started rendering using the spot pricing, which as you can see for this particular test, we used a C3 2X large system. And we rendered on uh, 20 of them, right? So, uh, you know, eight procs a piece. Uh, you know, the render time significantly faster than rendering on a triple Titan system locally at seven cents cost per hour. So for all of those systems, you know, we're looking at a $2.80, right? So uh, to get your workstation back 
Oh, sorry, that is, uh, yeah, so one hour, 23 minutes, you get your workstation back. Would you pay $2.80 for that? I, th I think I would. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you here, so we have a, a spinning chair to blend, which um, is a, a 4K uh, file. Uh, so we were uh, executing that with subframe rendering, uh, five by five in this case. Uh, again, I did the same test, uh, executed it locally on my local workstations, executed it uh, on a C3 2X large, 20 of them, and then recombined the frame. Uh, again, $1.40, <laughs> so, you know, for what is that, uh, you know, less than a cup of coffee, uh, you can certainly get uh, that output and get your system back. Um, and then uh, I did the same thing with the winterscape.blend. Again, uh, 20 C3 2X large systems, um, recombine the images. In this case, I was using a 10 by 10 subframe. Uh, two hours, 24 minutes versus a uh, triple Titan GPU setup, uh, two hours, 40 minutes. So roughly equivalent, uh, looks like it's a little bit faster. And again, th the nice thing about cloud uh, rendering pricing is that I used uh, 20 systems here and it was $4 and 20 and it took, uh, what is that? Two hours and 24 minutes. If I used a hundred systems here, it would be exactly the same price but it would be dramatically faster. And so it doesn't really matter if you use 20 systems and render it in two hours or 100 systems and render it in you know, one hour or however long that takes. Um, the, the pricing remains the same. Again, you're charged by the hour, right? So if it finishes in less than an hour on each system, uh, you'll still be charged for the full hour. So you need to do some you know, rough back of the napkin calculations to figure out um, you know, what your appropriate number of units, uh, nodes, or instances would be. So, uh, so that, you know, there, there's really some really great math that comes out of this. You start to realize how much faster your, your GPU and cloud rendering is when used together than just using your GPU. And uh, for me, if I can finish a big render job for less than a price of a Starbucks coffee, I think that's a major win. That concludes what I wanted to share with you in this session. We looked at utilizing Amazon cloud services for Blender Cycles rendering. We looked at one commercial render farm solution called Deadline 7 from Thinkbox Software. And then we looked at a set of free and open source Python scripts called Brenda from James Yonan and how to use Amazon spot pricing for getting ridiculously cheap render hardware that will save you from that large capital outlay needed to build your own render farm. Blender and Cycles rendering is really one of the rare applications that can handle terminate happy nature of spot markets. So one of the goals of publishing this session is to make render farm software developers like those from the Blender Foundation who are writing Flamenco aware of the spot market and to enhance render farm software to be resilient enough to use it. Anyhow, hopefully you found the session useful and it enables you to think bigger when it comes to your next Blender project. Until then, happy blending.